Hello, everyone. Welcome to Access Chat. Today, of course, I'm being joined by uh, my partner, Antonio Santos, who, who we call our magic sauce. And Neil Milliken, for some odd reason, decided to sell his house and move right in the middle of this crisis. But, you know, things happen and, you know, people want the house they bought. So um, we, wish we'll, we wish Neil much success in this move. So, and today our guest is Mindy Shire, and we've actually had Mindy on the program before. It's been years. But Mindy is the founder and um, I don't, I don't want to change your title, Mindy, but the founder and CEO of Runway yeah. of Dreams. Yeah. And she also has a new firm, which we're going to talk about today, Gamut. And it's very exciting. And I think it's a very important part of fashion accessibility and representation matters and all those things. So Mindy, we're going to um, definitely make sure that our audience knows about your past episodes. So we'll include that in our messaging. But would you mind telling our audience again who you are, who is Runway of Dreams, who's Gamut, and just bring us up to speed because it has been a few years since we talked to you. Yes. And, and first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show again. I Always love seeing your faces and, and being some, a part of something so important. Um, and it's really exciting, actually, to talk about where we are now versus a couple of years ago, because to be honest, I can't believe how much has happened in a couple of years. So last we spoke, um, I believe that it was uh, shortly after the launch of our uh, first uh, collection with Tommy Hilfiger that we made fashion history um, w by creating the first ever mainstream adaptive clothing line with a mainstream manufacturer. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of them and it's Tommy Hilfiger. And you actually also had Gary Scheinbaum on the show as well, uh, who's the CEO. But even before that, just in case that we have some new viewers, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background so that everything kind of really makes sense of the timeline. So I am a fashion designer by trade. Uh, I worked in the industry my whole career, but life had a very different path for me as my middle child has a rare form of muscular dystrophy, same as Oliver, and I have two other children as well. Um, and we realized really early on that Oliver was going to struggle with everyday tasks one of which was dressing himself, the very thing that I not only built a career on, um, but I loved to do every single day. And I have to thank you personally that I got to dress up today and put on lipstick that I haven't done in a very long time, <laughs> at least in the past few weeks. So thank you for that gift, Deborah. Yes. What is the, the hashtag stay home, stay safe? Yes. Even though not everybody agrees with that, but yeah, yeah. So yeah. we're all at home. At, we are all at home. So it was a great joy to be able to put on something happy and get dressed up again. So thank you. But what was my great joy was um, a, a daily reminder for Oliver that he cannot do basic things like buttoning his shirt, zippering, anything, putting on shoes, etc. And it really was an important um, shift in our life that he required complete help in, in something so basic as dressing yourself. So when he started school, um, our way of making it possible for him to go to the bathroom on his own, to be able to dress himself was for him to wear sweatpants every day um, and either a t-shirt or a sweatshirt because he could not manage anything that had buttons or zippers in it. So one day he came home from school, he was eight years old and in first grade and expressed to us that he wanted to be able to wear jeans. He couldn't understand why everybody else had choice in what they wore and what they showed up to the world in, except for him. And it was an incredible aha moment that here I was in the fashion industry, dedicated my career to it. And I needed my eight year old to remind me how critically important clothing is to who you are as a person and your confidence level and the fact that he had no choice in his life and felt like he was dressing disabled, which was such a profound statement from an eight-year-old um, that it, it truly rocked my world, if I'm being honest, in that I, I missed it. 
I missed something so critically important. And it opened my eyes to the fact that if Oliver was struggling with this, how in the world did the almost 1 billion people on our planet manage clothing challenges? Whether they weren't able to dress themselves independently or possibly could if modifications were made to clothing to make it easier. This was and that, Mindy, yeah, sorry. Mindy, ex no, excuse me for interrupting you, but I was thinking when I have always had um, a weight problem. And when I was a little girl, when I was, when I was a young girl in, in my preteen and teen years, I really had a weight problem as did a lot of my peers. And our clothing options were so ugly. It just emphasized, it felt like it emphasized that something was wrong with me. And I never thought about what Oliver had said, dressing, disabled dressing, that, that is very profound. And, um, and, and, I th and the fashion industry woke up to the fact that there are women that are different sizes. Um, but I, I just wanted to point that out because I just thought that was such a profound thing that Oliver said. So thank it, you for letting me It really me was. And that's it. It's an, a, a very relevant parallel, the plus size industry, because it is, I, I use it often as an example that there is a category that 20 years ago, most if not all mainstream designers didn't want any part of because that wasn't the typical body. That, they didn't want to be celebrating women uh, and men, they just call it big and tall, uh, that were not the, the typical body. And it is the exact same for people with disabilities. It's not the typical body. There's, there's the, the abilities affect how the body is shaped what the body is able to do in terms of dressing yourself. Um, so it's, it's a critically um, accurate parallel that you just made. And one that is an example that I used for the fashion industry to say, we have a huge opportunity here. Plus size is a $70 billion industry now that it took 20 years for the industry to understand that they were missing out on a huge upper opportunity with that population. And the fact of the matter is the population of people with disabilities is multiple times bigger than the plus size industry, actually to the tune that it is the largest minority we have on our planet are people with disabilities. So the numbers that are coming out of estimates of of what the adaptive market could be are, is to the tune of $300 billion that is being left on the table. And, and growing. growing. Because of I course, know now that my husband has, you know, dementia and he no longer, he can't dress himself anymore. We have to help him. And it's, you know, the, these adaptive styles are making a huge difference from us, not having to tie your shoes just for a little example, my husband can't do his buttons anymore. Zippers are baffling and they baffle me sometimes, but um, it's sorry to keep interrupting you, but it's, those numbers are growing and growing too. They're, they're actually perfect interruption because let's even take the notion of the zipper, the button and the buttonhole. By the way, here's a, a fun statistic. Do you know when the button and buttonhole was invented? Just take a guess. Um, 1800s? I, I have no... <laughs> the 13th century. The wow. 13th century is when that, that, that concept, that technology was developed. The fact that we are still using that in a world that we can run our lives from our phones is almost hard to get your mind around. And same with the zipper. Um, so not only does the industry have an opportunity for a, a, a business, a new revenue stream, but also from a technology perspective? Why in the world are we still using, for anybody, for able-bodied people as well, a technology that was developed in the 1300s is, is almost preposterous, actually is preposterous. So we have all this opportunity and it just took, I think, a, a beautiful cross-section in my life, at least, of the fact that I had the background to be able to make change happen for people with disabilities. So Runway of Dreams served as the found foundation 
um, and the platform that I was able to take my background, take my contacts that I had in the industry. I had done a year's worth of research, so I had really good data about the size of the market of people with disabilities, the spending power of people with disabilities, and the fact that this was a huge opportunity. That now fast forward, here we are in 2020, and not only is Tommy Hilvier has a, a, a actual division within the Tommy portfolio called Tommy Adaptive, but we now have Zappos has Zappos Adaptive. Target has the Cat and Jack Adaptive line and is only growing. Kohl's, as of last September, launched their adaptive versions of their children's wear lines. Nike is the fly sneaker. So the fact that I can state within a fairly short amount of time, five major brands that are dedicating, dedicating um, not only um, internally, their, their, their workforce, their acknowledgement that this population is important and is a business opportunity is so tremendous. And, and Runway of Dreams has been on the forefront of this movement and mission um, by bridging the gap between the population of people with disabilities and the fashion industry. And I, I do have to say, Deborah, it was a lot because of your support um, and what Access Chat can do, what, what Rue Global has done in support of Runway of Dreams. And I think that is such an, an important thing to underscore because it does take a village. We cannot do this in, in a vacuum or in a silo. This has to be everybody that is a mover and a shaker in the, in the world of disability has got to come together to say that we cannot do this without each other. I and agree. it's the same conversation that I'm having with the fashion industry, that when could I say that in Fashion Week, uh, September 20, uh, this past one that we had, so in 2019, on our runway was Kohl's, Zappos, and Tommy Hilfiger. Yeah. Let me just give a little insight that that doesn't happen in the world of fashion. They don't share runways. This is, this is very much, the, you know, their, their platform. But let's use that as an example for even the population and everybody that's working in that, that if the industry can come together and say, we have to do this together. Right. So right. yes, we are going to share a runway because it's that important for our world to understand that people with disabilities are consumers too, that right, we right. will share runways. So I, I think, uh, you know, our example of how we've worked together through Runway of Dreams and Rue Global um, and what we're going to be doing together with Gamut is an example that companies need to understand that we, and, and other nonprofits, to be perfectly honest, we have to work together, especially in this climate of, <laughs> You know, uh, sharing, we're going to have to really scramble for donated dollars now that they're going to be few and far between. That this is how we're going to make it happen. I know that Antonio has a question, so let me turn it over to him. But, oh, yes. And also, the representation matters. I know that because of your work, a lot of fashion designers and models um, are starting to come out. And it's really, it's really a cause. And it's exciting. I know that Samantha Bullock is one that really has watched what you've done. And she's expanding what she's doing. And there's so many other wonderful examples. But Antonio had a question. So let me turn it over to him before we go to Gamut. So Antonio? Uh no, I think for, for, for many years, the fashion industry was put into a very high place in the kind of pedestal. Now, and you was, oh, no, you were able to, to see and consume information through magazines, through traditional media. Today, the consumers are providing real-time feedback yes. through social media. Uh, do you see that brands are paying attention and are listening? And this is somehow uh, what, make them to take action that they realize that they need to answer to the demand and then they need to provide a, an answer to people that is actually human 
they cannot justify themselves with art and design to do what they have been making over the la over the last fifty years. I I absolutely think so, and I do believe that that is. I often get asked, why now? Why, why did it take so long? I mean, the reality is not until we launched with Tommy Hilfiger in 2016, that was the first time a mainstream designer ever even thought of the population. And I do think that the fact that we have social media and that feedback and that we are living through a consumer driven culture right now that that, that in the fashion industry, they need to respond to that is, is absolutely a reason that um, Adaptive is taking um, the fire that it is now and that brands are, are listening and reacting. But I also think that this is a population that has never um, had the opportunity to share their voice because really nobody was listening. And so now they are, the, the brands, I'm speaking specifically to the fashion industry, are not only in, listening and reacting, but it's because the community is sharing their voice and saying, we are, are so desperate for this product. Hear us, work with us, um, let's do this together. And that is, I'm, I'm foreshadowing right now, one of the reasons why we did create Gamut Management for just that reason to be able to allow the population to have a voice and have um, a presence in our pop culture. But I, I say this very often, specifically in the industry, that there is no design, there are no designers out there, myself included, that can design for people with disabilities without including people with disabilities into the process. It's an impossibility. There are no standards. There are no body shapes that are going to be the same. And so it has got to be a for the people, by the people design um, process. And I think that that is what the industry is understanding, that they have to hear what the population is saying and react to it. And so Tommy is doing, I can say, and actually all the brands that are in, in the mix right now are the feedback from the population is what is creating design changes. And that is an amazing place to be in. And do you see any designers with disability coming forward or feel them so, oh, now uh, we have an opportunity or you see brands giving that opportunity to, to back to them? I, th I think it's both. Um, I think that brands are um, expanding the, their knowledge on the fact that people with disabilities are consumers um, and that they can, they, the brands, can create product or modify their existing product to include this population. And I, I think that having the whether it's designers with disabilities or the population it's, um, voicing what can be done. I mean, the reality is many of, of you know, pe people in the, in the population have done design hacks, have figured this out because they had to. So now they're, so they're almost becoming their own designers. So now they're sharing that with with the the fashion industry to say we've been doing this for years here you go here's our hacks take it enjoy it do it but let's do it together so i think it's a combination and also as they do these hacks these hacks are really beneficial to everybody and that's yeah. what's so cool about inclusive design and accessibility when it's done right all the entire population benefits you know sometimes you know i've hurt my back and i can't bend down to you know and there you know there's so many of these hacks that everybody would benefit from and so and and of course as you have always said representation matters yeah and so and and we all know that societies society's expectations of corporations and them doing social good it is it has never been stronger and you yeah. have 
to tell us what you're doing. You have to show us how you're working with the community. And, and once again, representation matters. And so I like a lot of the efforts you've done with the intersectionality of, yeah. you know, disabilities and other diversity groups. And, and I think once again, that this is why gamut is needed because there is yeah. an appetite for this and we see it only growing and we see more people coming into the field and saying, I can contribute, I want to help, but how do we make sure these people come together and the voices are heard and we're really listened to? Absolutely. And that really is how gamut management was born. That through organically over the past couple of years, other brands or um, entertainment agents and the industry um, have reached out to Runway of Dreams and said, we see that there's, we need to start connecting with the population of people with disabilities, but we don't know how. We want to start having them in our commercials, but we don't know how to even find people with disabilities to do this. Can you help us? And so after all of these requests started coming in, it suddenly uh, occurred to me that if they're coming to a nonprofit for these requests, that must mean that there's, there's a gap in the market, that there is nowhere that they can go to connect with people with disabilities, whether that is to do surveys, to be a part of focus groups, to test products, to be in commercials, or to be involved in the entertainment industry. So I started doing research and there really wasn't any management companies that solely focused on people with disabilities. They might've had other divisions um, or some tokenism that they had one or two people with disabilities as clients, but it really takes um, a company that lives and breathes this population to be able to be the best supporter for requests that come in to fill the need for everything that I just mentioned. So Gamut Management was born to do just that. And we are a new type of management company and a for-profit company, which is very important that it is, this, this is a business opportunity to be able to represent this population and to help support companies and brands in not only understanding the population, but what it takes to create products that will not only create a new revenue stream for the brand or the company, but also we're creating a place for them to sell it to. We're creating a, a, a marketplace of people that have critical voices in the products that are being developed for them, the way that they are being represented and marketed to. So that is exactly what um, Gamma does. And, but we do it by bringing in experts in all aspects of the, re the value chain of businesses one of which is, is marketing. And that's where we are working with Rue Global because you are experts in how to market to people with disabilities. And so therefore, by bringing in all this, we are not only able to do much more than we ever could have than through the lens of a nonprofit, but we are doing it in a way that this population deserves. People with disabilities deserve to be, um, managed by a true for-profit management company that does things the way that any, any proper management company could do, but better because we know how to speak on behalf of this population. So you, know, you know, the nuances. So exactly. is it, is it, um, is it wise for us to create something like Gamut when you do have all these agencies out there? Shouldn't we demand that the agencies be more inclusive? Which, by the way, I know that's a trick question because, of course, we're going to continue to demand that. But yeah. I remember one time um, one, one corporate brand said, well, I'm just going to do this myself. Uh, I don't need to work with, you know, the community. I'll just do this myself. And I remember hearing you say, okay, well, just make sure, though, that you know everything's accessible and you're considering this and there's so many different moving nuanced parts to this and once again 
our community is finding our voice. We've been finding our voice for years and there are very amazing, you know, beautiful models that have all different kinds of visible disabilities. I also tell our clients that there's a time to make sure once again representation matters and you might be showing a model a beautiful model um, that does have hidden disabilities but we need in it when it comes to this type of conversation we need visible disability so we immediately know what you're talking about it's good for models to come out and disclose they have hidden disabilities we want to always encourage that but there is a lot of ways that brands can actually get in trouble not knowing this audience and not including us. And I was just wondering if you wanted to address a few of those. It's a great if point. And I'm happy that you did because those um, companies that you referenced are now coming back to us and saying, you know what, we should have listened to you uh, because we've made mistakes. And rightfully so, the population has a hard time forgiving. If you are going out there and saying, I'm making products or I want to do this for the population, but you're not doing it in an authentic way, that's not a good message to send. So the, it's, it's an interesting model that we're building because we don't want to replace those agencies that they're working with. We want to support them. We want to say, you are phenomenal at, at what you do but we know this population and we are the experts of this so we want to be a support for what you do so that you don't have to apologize for not doing it the right way to the population because this time you're going to do it right um, because we're going to be by your side so that's the model that we are creating that is allowing us to be able to work with existing companies and managements and agents and and not replacing them we have no interest in replacing them we want to support them so how do you bring in the rest of the community we were talking before we went on air that now that everybody's teleworking sometimes dogs are in um yes <laughs> sometimes so daughters, daughters, everybody sometimes it's daughters dogs, pop in. It's it's right. who, you, know, you never know who's going to walk through that door. That's right. That's right. So, but how can this help, you know, uh, you know, young people or people of all ages that have disabilities that want to be part of these fashion conversations? They want to be models. They want their work. They want to be seen. How does Gamut help the community find their voice and continue to show who they are and, you know, and really be represented? Well, the wonderful part, well, one of the many wonderful parts about Gamut is the only requirement that we um, ask for when you join Gamut as a client um, is that you have to have a disability. It, our, our point of difference is that we want to represent the masses because we feel everybody has a talent. Whether that is um, filling out a survey or being a part of a focus group or testing product. So we are much bigger than just a, a typical talent management company because we want to use our population in every aspect of what it takes to rebrand who people with disabilities are to our, our pop culture. So please join, please be a part of this because the, we become even more important when I can go out there and say, I have millions of people a part of the gamut because we are important. So be important with us and join us and be a client, be a member, share it with your communities because that's how we are going to make change happen. Right, and if you knew about a, a very talented designer in a wheelchair, in Columbia or wherever, you can help turn up the volume. That's one thing I like about Absolutely. supporting what you're doing is because it's going to take all of us together. We're stronger together. The world is showing us how we need to come together to solve the biggest problems. But 
you know, the, I, th I think of who, who needs to be part of the conversation, but they never even dreamed that they could be part of the conversation. Yeah. So I think that's what's exciting about it. No, they, they, need to be part, yeah. they need to be part of that conversation. And then when they are in that conversation and they are, you know, aspiring or developing their, their, their careers, they need to have a good experience with the brands. And I think that's something that you also want to achieve here, Mindy. Absolutely. And, and the brands need to experience that and going through typical marketing methodologies may not work for this population. So I, and I think that's actually being proven um, that y y we have to do this again for the people by the people. So if I can bring in our gamut network to help with the marketing plans and you know the impact that that Deborah and team have together is how we are going to make this happen and that's you know that's something that that we have to recalibrate the way typical mainstream brands think because they're and and I get that this is how they've been doing it for centuries and so we're trying to recalibrate how they how they do things typically and have them understand that we have to do this together or it's not going to work and i think they're understanding that now so mindy you you're really talking about gamut being really building the, the, not the community the community is there but one problem with our beautiful community is that we don't come together and talk from one voice, much less billions of voices. I mean, exactly. so many of our community isn't speaking in whatever way they speak, you know, even if they're using augmented communications, but we, you know, you, part of your dream is to bring the community together so we can have a bigger voice. And I was just exactly. wondering if, yeah. Exactly, and thank you, thank you for bringing that up because that is such a critical point of difference, even within, the population of people with disabilities were extremely siloed. The yes. muscular dystrophy community speaks to them. The, um, the autistic community speaks to the autistic community. And it it's, was a very hard um, piece to help the industry understand that I am not speaking on behalf of one community. I'm speaking on behalf of all of the communities. And that this is something that on both sides of the fence, we have to get better at because we, we're not going to be able to do this from a siloed perspective. So if we want the world to change, we have to do it together. So yes, gamut management speaks on behalf of the, the population, whether that's cognitive disabilities, whether it's physical disabilities, whether it's temporary disabilities together, we are so powerful, but we're not as powerful if we do it in our silos. We're just not. Right, right. and there's room for everybody. It, it can't just be about me. That's one reason why we do access chat because Antonio, Neil, and myself, we know it's not about us. We want to make sure there's platforms so that the community can be heard. And I know that's something, that's what spoke to me about the work that you were doing at Gamut. I always loved Runway of Dreams and I was an advisor on, I'm an advisor on Runway of Dreams, but I liked that you were going to build the community and find those little Mindy's that didn't even know that they could be a fashion designer if they wanted, or they could be on the runway or they could model or, Absolutely. and I know that I'm only talking about a few parts of the fashion industry. This is a gigantic industry with a ton of jobs. And I think, and this is for little boys, little girls, people with dis this for everybody. So I think that's the power of it. I know that we're out of time. So one thing I wanted to do first is thank our, our sponsors and our supporters, because we could not do this without you. Barclays Access, which we love. My Clear Text, MicroLink, which are amazing people supporting Access Chat, which we've been here for over five years. But before we go, I want to um, I want to give you time to tell people how they can find out about Gamut, and also yes. remind them how they can find out about Rue Globe. I mean Rue Global, sorry, uh, Runway of Dreams, sorry. <laughs> and they don't need to worry about Rue Global. But but what? But at the same time, what if I am somebody that's hearing this and I'm like, 
I've always wanted to do this. How, where do they even go? How do they get to you, Mindy? How do they get to your team to say, I want to participate, whether they're a corporation saying, I want to do it, or they're an individual with a disability that know they can add value to these conversations. Yes. And before I say that, first of all, thank you so much for having me on again. It's always such a, a joy. And Antonio, it was so nice to see you again. And I'm very, very grateful to all the work that, that you have done. So thank you sponsors also. Um, so please go to gamut management, all one word, dot com. Um, and we guide you right through how to join, whether that is to become a client or if you are a company and you are interested in learning uh, more about how we can help support you. Um, and just to remind everybody, Runway of Dreams is our nonprofit partner, and you can go to runwayofdreams.org to find out more information about what we do, our charitable programs, and how you can get involved. And Mindy, how do you spell gamut? I only say that because I remember when I first did it, I, a couple of times Thank I you. would misspell it. So G-A-M-U-T, as okay. in it runs the gamut. That is how we view ourselves. We run the gamut. Yes, and this is all about inclusion of all. So very powerful time for this to be happening. So yeah. Mindy, thank you to you. Thank, thank you. you to Antonio. You. And good luck, thank Neil, you. with your moving. <laughs> and we'll see everybody <laughs> on Bye. Twitter, thank Twitter you. on Tuesday. <laughs>